Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start the lecture um, with uh, Natasha Dow Shul, a professor in media, culture, and communication at the at NYU, New York University, on the theme lifestyle algorithms, wearable technology as self-regulation. So I just want to say a uh, couple of sentences about <coughs> when I first met Natasha um, in Amsterdam, and it was. Uh, she was giving a deep history of quantification of some of the scholars and icons of their times and then relating that to the, the current scene that, that began evolving and began evolving quite quickly and hasn't stopped yet. So that, um, that was really a great uh, inspiration. And I found her workshop, in fact, mesmerizing. And I was, um, <coughs> and I found this mesmerization uh, to be, um, part of what I really learned and gained from the, uh, this, um, this sort of romance and frictions that we have of ourself, of ourselves, and, and, how, uh, and how that mesmerization also is reflected in her wonderful book, Addiction by Design. So with that, I turn it over to Natasha. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. And, uh, Thanks to all for being here and those who came to lunch. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about one thread in my project. Um, those who know my work in my book and other pieces I've done know that I like to kind of triangulate between design and experience. And today I'm going to focus more on the design, being that we're, we're here, you know, in, in this context, focus a little bit more on the design side and the, the logics of self-regulation. Um, that are built into wearable technology. But I thought I would start by narrating how I got uh, from my <coughs> prior work to this project, uh, because tracking is at stake in both, but in different ways. So uh, that project uh, that turned eventually into the book Addiction by Design was, like my current project, an inquiry in into the contemporary relationships between digital devices and selves. And in that work, I showed how everything uh, that you could include under the umbrella of casino design, so um, architecture, <laughs> how low the ceilings are, um, ergonomic chairs, the audio visuals, um, and maybe most critically, the design of the game algorithms in the machine, the math, how all of that <coughs> made machine gambling this, this particularly expedient vehicle for retreating from the self and retreating from the world. Um, the, there was a sort of speed, repetition, and continuity of machine play that pulled some players, still pulls them, uh, into a state they call the machine zone. And this is, a, this is a kind of state in which daily worries and social demands and even bodily awareness can fade away. Um, there's a kind of tight feedback loop between the player and the machine that's almost a sort of bubble. Um, as depicted here in casino advertising material. So of course, um, as this advertisement communicates, this bubble is not free floating. It's very much an object of scrutiny uh, by the casino industry, <coughs> both in the sense that it attempts to produce that bubble and hold it as the hands are doing, um, and also in the sense that it's closely tracking uh, the behavior that goes on within it in order to, to more profitably guide that behavior. And the player tracking was the last piece of research, as I was saying over lunch, uh, that I undertook for this first book project. Uh, and it, it's become even more important in the casino industry and beyond this issue of customer tracking. Um, since then, uh, nearly 80% of casino customers play with these cards that you see here, sometimes called. There's kind of like frequent flyer cards, loyalty programs. Um, only 20% of people out there are playing with money or coins. Um, so, this, so they're being tracked. More and more people are being tracked. And they are getting redeemable points uh, based on the volume of their play. And meanwhile, casinos are getting this wealth of information. Um, this information a little different than um, other, other information out there. Uh, it's almost laboratory key press data. That's how one casino executive described it to me. He had a background in um, behavioral science. Uh, because you can see 
and then make correlations between all of these variables, such as how fast is somebody pressing a button um, in relation to what volati volatility index the game is, when are they asking for a drink, when are they leaving, and you can create these historically robust player profiles. Um, and you, you can't read the information on it, but this is such a profile and it's being um, tapped into by a manager um, off of the casino floor. Um, and then on the right is a kind of enlivened, colorful heat map of the casino floor representing banks of slot machine with uh, people around them. And um, blue would mean someone's playing there but not generating a huge amount of revenue for the property, whereas the red bubbles um, would, would mean that's really where the money is at. Uh, and here I thought I'd play you what one of those heat maps looks like when you play it. And you see the clock in the upper left corner there. And so this is a sort of 24-hour, um, or maybe it's two 24-hour um, cycles. And maybe you just saw that, maybe not. Let me back it up a teeny, a, a little touch. Um, so if you watch here, at some point there's like a bubble there, and then there's a big bubble, and then it goes away. Uh, and that, I don't know if it's at this part of the clock or some other part, but that happens and they couldn't figure out why. And they drilled into it and they said, um, isn't that interesting? There's, these are sort of young women players, 20 to 30 years old. Um, they're playing, then for some reason they're moving from this end of the bank of the machines to the other end. And then they're just leaving the property and going home. Um, and they couldn't figure it out until they dispatched a live sort of casino ethnographer <laughs> to stand there. And it turned out that this area was a sexy review show, and older men were coming out and bothering them. And so they were moving down the row, and then they were leaving. And then this, this uh, got told as a story of success of this behavioral analytics software that was called C Power, that Bally and Microsoft were both kind of involved in, because they decided, let's build these women a special slot shelter and we'll make it lavender and we'll do a marketing campaign and then they they doubled their their revenue <laughs> um, and here's another um, example this is the sydney i believe and what's what's going on here is the the little old ladies um, they're seeing when do these older women <coughs> play uh, so these are women on the casino floor but they're mapping them to their neighborhoods so that they can know when to market to a certain neighborhood, when they should shift the denomination or whatever specials are going on on the, um, the casino uh, offerings at any one time in order to target them better. So um, I just put that up there to show you these, these, these techniques that I was seeing in the early 2000s being applied in casinos that really <coughs> caught my interest and they seem to be a perfect articulation of the uh, what I had been saying until then in my work about design ergonomics etc but it seemed that there was a lot more to explore there and I wanted to do a next project uh, that was on <coughs> tracking um, and there was no shortage of those projects out there for the taking I think with the, the rise of mobile and especially uh, smartphone and sensor technology um, this has not only gone online, but it's gone out into the wild, so to speak. Um, and accompanying that development has been a great deal of focus, both in the popular media and in academia, on the, the, the often, very often questionable ways that governments and corporations are collecting data on citizens and on consumers, particularly behavioral data, and how such tracking might threaten their personal identity, their liberty, um, their privacy. Um, however, I felt as a scholar reluctant to take that path um, because I felt, to be honest, existentially depleted, if you will, by having spent years digging into um, this, this kind of um, corporate manipulation of behavior and how they attempt to adjust and control and steer consumers. But I was still interested in tracking. So. Um, when I heard this phrase, quantify itself, and I happened to be in Cambridge, um, where there happened to be a lot of meetings, I started to go, um, also known as QS. This is an international collective of individuals, and it was started by two editors at Wired Magazine, uh, who ascribed to the quest for self-knowledge through numbers, as you see in the tagline. Um, it's a kind of, um, you may have heard the term biosociality, this is, I see this as a kind of data sociality, 
where quantified selfers come together and participate in forums and meetings around the world and share their attempts to experiment with different algorithms and devices and tracking methods to correlate things ranging from hormone levels to semantic content of emails to relationship dynamics. Uh, and the, so the research I was doing there really afforded a different vantage on data tracking than I had had in my first book and that I was seeing out in a lot of the, the academic literature. Because here we have a phenomenon where individuals are employing these gadgets and software to, to scrutinize the quanta of their own lived experience and it, it, almost embracing numerical metrics and statistical correlation um, as a route to the good life, an, an ethical project. And you can see just a sense of that here in this visualization by um, a woman who tracked 2.5 years of her weight and she says, I gained a lot of insights from this heat map. So this felt, that, that expression, you know, I gained a lot of insights uh, from this heat map really felt different than my earlier research on zoned out gamblers being tracked by big corporations who were, who were in the position of gaining the insights. Um, the ethos was much more DIY, citizen science, take charge of your own data. Um, <coughs> however, uh, as I was sitting in uh, on, on these meetings, you know, this project is very much of a moving target and it certainly hasn't stopped moving even now, uh, which makes it uh, very interesting methodologically. So uh, in the back of the rooms of these quantified self meetings, th this other sort of uh, species of participants started showing up, you could say, and they, they came to be known as the quantrepreneurs. And they were not there with anything personally at stake to share. They weren't there to self-fashion, to put their own data at stake in any kind of ethical project. Um, they were there to monetize this formula of QS um, to take it to market. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna track, I'm gonna track tracking as it moves from this relatively fringe phenomenon out into the aisles of Best Buy, um, where you see <coughs> this is an old slide, but at that time there was 143 matches in this category of distance traveled. Um, the online marketplace of Amazon, uh, which in 2014 <coughs> launched a specialty shop for wearable technology and um, with 800 project pro products at the time. And um, this text that you can't read from where you're sitting down here was interesting. I'm not sure it's still there. They put it up at first because it kind of, um, it's almost a pedagogical appeal to consumers who may have stumbled upon it. And it does it like, um, here's some ways you could use this. Do you need help remembering to exercise? So it's sort of priming the market and um, in engaging them. And also tracked it to the Consumer Electronics Show, which every year um, has more and more booths and floor space dedicated to um, these kinds of gadgets. Uh, equipped, to, I'm focusing on gadgets today, but I also mean apps. Um, the kind of apps that we download onto our phones. But here I'm focusing more on gadgets. Uh, these gadgets that, that were apps that gather real-time information from our bodies and our lives, convert that into some kind of electrical signal, run it through <coughs> algorithms that are programmed to reveal insights uh, and inform interventions into our future behavior. So 2013, um, when I first started going to these uh, Consumer Electronics Show meetings. This is a report from that meeting. And it was uh, suggesting that that year was the year of the quantified self. So really, QS was the model at that time for designers of this technology. Um, it provided the model of what the technology should look like, how it should operate, and what sort of self it should assume, and even the, the values of that self. Um, here, this journalist writes that it's about consciously track, keeping track. On the title of my book, will be keeping track. Um, the, so, so it's about consciously keeping track of my healthy or unhealthy choices. Uh, and that year at QS, uh, and or 2014, I think, and the, the Digital Health Summit, which is a panel stream that takes place um, alongside it. Uh, I attended in 2014, the very same week that Obamacare was rolled out. Um, and there was a great deal of talk about 
how the technology could be used to regulate everyday behavior like overeating, <coughs> over sitting, under exercising, lifestyle diseases, which I heard people um, on that stage characterize as diseases where you have a choice. And uh, choice was seen as the target of intervention. And the means of intervention was to increase awareness. So if it was you know, consciously keeping track, self-awareness, so you would see the word awareness everywhere. You would hear the word if, as you strolled the aisles. Um, here is one characterization of the logic here. This is um, someone in Verizon who was in healthcare management markets. You can build a profile or picture of what it is you're doing. This lets you see and understand the choices you're making on a daily basis, which is really what your health is. The choices you make all day long, whether to take the stairs or the elevator, what you will eat or not eat. So mundane consumer choices. And here's the logic. You have to see the logic of regulation. You have to see how your choices are impacting you. See how the gauges are moving as you make choices. And the idea was that that awareness would then trigger change. And so I, I heard something that gets said a lot in many domains, but here it was, um, be the CEO of your own, um, be the CEO of your own health. So you could make a kind of a quick cultural diagnosis here, which is a diagnosis that a lot of scholars have made, which I don't think is incorrect. Um, but I think there's more to the story. And that diagnosis is, here we have self-tracking, here we have quantified self. This exemplifies the neoliberal withdrawal of the state and the placing of governance responsibility onto individual citizens. And I want to suggest that, uh, yes, of course, that kind of imperative is very much at stake uh, here, but I don't think it's an imperative that's at stake in any straightforward way. And I think it's worth pausing to ask, um, you know, what, what's distinctive about this emerging form of, of healthcare? Is it really about mastering ourselves, optimizing our health, and being responsible? Or might it, in some ways, be about wanting to be non-consumer sovereigns, non-sovereign <laughs> selves, wanting to outsource some, some labor of you know, managing <coughs> these choices to technology? And that's just a different way to look at it, um, but it, it changes the story somewhat. So, uh, sorry, there's something here where I can't get my mouse. Okay. Hmm. So I can't see my notes. All right, well, um, what I kept noticing as I went back to CES every year, and this was what was so rich about this project, project to me, or this, this terrain as a kind of moving target, was that every year I went back. You know, a year had passed, and everyone was there saying, you know, what are we going to show? How are we going to articulate the vision of our technology? Um, and it would change, and it would shift. And so I could actually track from one year to, a ne to the next how this logic of self-tracking was shifting. Um, and <coughs> the know-yourself logic kept waning. That's really what I noticed, that every year, the, the quantified self model, which had sort of kicked it all off, which was the original thing that got monetized, the know thyself, the consciously track, started to uh, get more and more diluted. And that was partly because it didn't seem to be working out so well, because there would also be these <coughs> six month or yearly reports saying, oh, we've done a study and it seems that consumers put away these devices in the drawer after three months because we don't know why exactly. Um, you know, then there'd be the study. 90% of us are not like quantified self people. We aren't motivated by seeing our own data. That kind of model for self change and self transformation isn't going to work. Um, not everyone has the time, the resources, or um, even the desire to embark on that kind of ethical project, one that requires a deep amount of reflection, specifically reflection on information and numbers and data. Um, so the idea was that people were overwhelmed by life and that that's the problem behind lifestyle diseases and in fact giving them more to manage in the form of information was overwhelming them and they, they were experiencing what I like to, I kind of like to do a play on this idea of data exhaust that all the data <coughs> exhaust we give off and collect creates a kind of affect of, of data exhaust, you know, we're just, we're we're fatigued by managing all of our data. 
so the growing consensus at CS gradually was that people would, would be discouraged by seeing their numbers and that in fact you had to de-quantify. So not only was there a waning of the self, but there was a waning of numbers. So um, some companies, I heard them talking about how um, you know, old school products like the weighing scale would show a number, but new generation scales are going to instead vibrate in a confirming way on your feet. If you're within a general area where your weight can fluctuate, so you're not going to freak someone out by half a pound that statistically means nothing, and it will give you an alert or a different kind of vibration when maybe it's apparent that you're getting off tracks. So they would help keep you on track in the, manner, in the manner of a coach, but a coach who doesn't put on you um, the burden of all of the little measurements and movements of your data. So, <coughs> sorry, let me just try to fix my mouse so I can actually see what I'm doing here. Uh, where did it go? I'm not sure why this would happen. Hmm. Does anyone know how to make a mouse appear when it's totally disappeared? It's on the other screen. Oh, so you need to, so there it is. You need to either okay. pull it to one side or down, I think. I'm going to move it this way. Isn't that the way to do it? Here I have it. Yay. Okay. There. All right. So what I want to do in my remaining time is, is to kind of transition to um, the, the, the giving you a real sense of the, the, the matter of this technology, how this, uh, this turn from know thyself to, um, to something else <laughs> is showing up in the technology. That's what I want to kind of track by looking at some actual technologies and cases of them. I want to I want to look at that vision of technologically assisted self-care and ask, you know, what new models of living are being proposed, are being enabled by these technologies. So the language and logic of self-tracking products was shifting, as I said, uh, away from knowing yourself toward the device knowing you, and you can see that here. This is an ad for the Samsung wristband that's from about 2015. And she it says, this device can know me better than I know myself and can help me be a better human. So it's being a better human, it's absolutely still an ethical project, uh, but more epistemological authority is now given to uh, the device. And as we'll see, it's going to shift even further away, more toward um, so-called frictionless guidance, where you don't always even know that you're being guided. So to, to begin tracking that, uh, that shift. The products that I'm going to consider uh, are addressing these really rudimentary aspects of existence. And if you stop and think about it, I mean, it's a little funny, but it's also a little disturbing, <laughs> perhaps, that th these are mainly things that we learn when we're infants, when we're really small. Um, these are forms of self-regulation that wouldn't be apparently in need of um, digital mediation um, or even uh, sort of moral consideration, <laughs> stepping, sitting, standing, <coughs> sipping, chewing, and breathing. So I'm going to start with stepping and play without sound um, some of a uh, Fitbit video of uh, this, this wrist tracker, that's wrist tracker, it's become a kind of metonym for consumer wearables. Um, and it, it embodies information provision and self-knowledge. He's checking in uh, with his information. Um, and here you have someone going about her life, trusting that in the background uh, it's capturing this information. But the idea is she will eventually look at that. Uh, and then here in the next scene, I think we have a man who is pausing at the turnstile, slowly turning to face this other path he could choose. And then he sets off on that other path um, and realizes these, these potential 2,000 steps that he now adds to his count. And, and here you, you see these sort of data, these concentric rings of data around this person's feet. So it's, it's becoming aware of all of this data exhaust and how it's adding up to affect your life. Um, and here's a woman sleeping. So she's asleep and it's happening in the background. So there's something being given over to the device. Um, but it's still a kind of know yourself by consulting your uh, your uh, data. So you're now in the role of the consulter. And so here we see that role being played out. This is you're <coughs> participating in the gesture of keeping track. 
Uh, the, the device is a kind of digital compass. Um, if we didn't know this was a self-tracker, we could say, oh, that's an ad for finding your car in a parking lot, or she lost her keys or something. It's some, some kind of compass-like device. Um, and I think that the, the larger sense that marketers and designers had was that people are in the position of having to navigate this sometimes toxic, tempting, and confounding consumer uh, marketplace, uh, and that they needed help being aware of these small daily decisions that can add up to big results. You know, how much to sip and step and sleep. So hydration, um, I'll give you a sense of uh, how, how people are pictured wearing um, these devices. This is another mundane but vital human action. Uh, and you know, wearables, sometimes we think of as strapping them on, but in a way, these are wearables too. They're meant to accompany you throughout the day. Um, and some of these bottles will automatically adjust your daily goals based on the humidity, uh, the temperature, and then it'll communicate with you in different ways, flashing lights, sort of calling out to you, saying not, not just something you decide to consult when, you, when it occurs to you, but something that says, hi, it's time to take a sip now. Um, it could be through color, it could be through sound, et cetera. And here's an example of this kind of communicational matrix. Um, then we come to the happy fork. The happy fork, um, I always love this ad because it's a time when we have so much discussion about putting your phone, that part of the whole problem with us is that we don't um, eat together and that if we ate together in a social way, we would modulate ourselves better. But here it's just a woman, a fork, a salad, and a phone in this kind of loop. Um, but as, as you might guess, it, it modulates the activity of eating. And the way that it does that is it, it's, it's not only the length of a meal and the number of fork servings, but the critical uh, point of intervention is the time between each serving. So if it's shorter than 10 seconds, the fork, the, the fork vibrates and you get this message um, and, and an alarm, an audible alarm saying, you know, oops, uh, too fast, and now I will, I will read from the actual product literature. You were advised to take about 10 to 20 chews. If you trigger the happy fork alarm by eating too fast, don't panic. Set the fork down at the side of the plate and wait until the light turns green again, <laughs> signaling that it is safe uh, to take another bite. So it's, you know, chewing, chewing is, this, um, is this domain in which danger and safety um, is being talked about. And, you know, but with a view to, the, to the, you know, that our problem, our predicament is lifestyle diseases, diseases that, where you have a choice, and choices are tiny and bitified, and that's where this, that is what this fork is addressing. Um, so the, 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 the company, um, recommend you always keep your phone with you so you can see your data as it's collected in, in real time. And you know, this is a funny example, and it's certainly been mocked. Um, some of you may have seen the, the Stephen Colbert, who, who called the fork un-American because it promoted slow consumption. Um, but it, but it, is a real, it is a real fork. Um, and it's a kind of you know, techno-dressage, you could say, or um, algorithmic entrainment. And the idea is that you will learn through doing this um, how to eat better, so you don't have to consult your data. You could just use the fork and it will act on you. So, um, another that uh, more purely vibrational course corrector is the Lumo Lift, which is um, addressing your posture. Uh, and here is again from the literature, through the app you control when you're buzzed, how you're buzzed, and how intensely um, it buzzes. So there's definitely, again, a kind of um, entrainment here. And um, the idea plays on this idea of um, small moments, or in this case, degrees of inclination, or bites, or steps, little, little bitified things. Um, small changes can be empowering, one, one of the ads says. Um, mm. And there's a whole story here to be told, or a set of connections to be made between certain kinds of corporate professional workspaces and productivity and the kind of upright <coughs> posture. Um, there's another ad where uh, 
younger woman in a boardroom is kind of slumped in the corner with this attitude of being ignored. And then the, it buzzes and she raises her shoulders and everyone turns to her. And she's <laughs> an object of authority in that moment. Okay, so stepping, sipping, sitting, and standing. And here we have the spire, which is this device uh, that helps regulate the breath, which is maybe of these things the most elemental um, of, of human, um, you want to call it an action, functions. Uh, and then by extension to regulate your stress levels, as you see here, it's about calmness. So it will alert you if your breath is becoming too shallow or erratic or too fast. Um, and it will give you, you know, like the fork does, time for a deep breath, and it vibrates on your body as well. So you don't have to look at your phone, it will just um, vibrate. And um, here's one that's posture and breath, um, you know, being a sort of calling users to attention. Um, and it's a, it's a similar sort of office story of someone who's gradually forgetting and slouching and caught up in stuff and then um, in comes this device to kind of call her to attention eventually in this video. <coughs> so let's step back for a moment from that like, whirlwind tour of this, uh, this kind of technology. Uh, what, what do we make of all of this as a mode of self-regulation? Um, as we've seen, things like chewing and sitting have become kind of dangerous. The environment is a hostile one. It's not a very holding environment. It's not an environment that would, in which you would easily make the right choice if left to your, to your own devices, so to speak. So maybe you need these other devices to help uh, kind of keep you okay um, to, and, and work against this, this toxic choice architecture that is, that's hobbling our ability to thrive. That's kind of the, the narrative here. Um, and the selves of self-tracking, like this figure here, I think it evokes it quite well, is thought to be a choosing agent, uh, confronted with many choices, uh, but, and, and whose, whose well-being depends on those choices, vigilant, savvy consumer choices, what to buy, what to bite, how long to chew. Uh, but these are people who are thought um, by, by no fault of their own to lack knowledge, the foresight, and the resources um, to navigate all of these choices. Uh, and so the wearable technology, I think, is banking on that double insecurity that, that the customers that they're imagining and addressing are not sure whether to trust their own desires or senses or intuitions in any one moment. Like, oh, I want to eat that. I want to sit down. I want to slouch. Uh, and so they're making these mundane yet really <coughs> vital, critical choices. Uh, and the, de the devices are there to take the guesswork to tell them what they should do in that moment. Um, and interestingly, they're designed not just to, uh, increasingly, they're designed not just to offer information or reassurance in the manner of a compass, but to act, and I'm quoting here, in the manner of a thermostat. That was something I heard, um, I think, at the 2015 or 16 um, CES show. Um, to reach out and poke us, nudge us, taps, buzzes, zaps, etc. Um, so this, this is a kind of nudgeable subject, and there's a whole, you know, we could put this in conversation with nudge as a governance philosophy of recent I administrations. Um, there are certain ways it conforms to that or departs from that, but just to say that, that this nudgeable subject that's addressed by wearable technology, by app makers, doesn't, I don't think, neatly conform to the neoliberal consumer, to, to homo economicus, to the consumer sovereign. Um, someone who optimizes and also aspires to autonomy. In fact, if you really think about it from another perspective and don't slot it immediately into that um, kind of analytic grid for diagnosing contemporary society, um, I think you see that uh, this injunction to self-manage and track is almost an injunction to give some of your willpower or agency or, um, you know, as I said before, a kind of epistemological authority to big data, to uh, these algorithms, these nudging algorithms. So this falls somewhere in between enterprise and submission, responsibility and discipline, um, and you could even say maybe it's constituted by these tensions. Uh, and by that I mean that to, to self-track, there are both things going on. To self-track is to heavily value your choices and your need to be responsible for them. 
you're not like the slot machine addict I wrote about in my first book, whose response to feeling overwhelmed is to just zone out. You want to stay in the game. You want to stay in the world. Um, but at the same time, you want to be relieved of the responsibility because you just simply don't know exactly what and when to do as a subject located in space and time without this kind of statistical overview of how your little choices are adding up. So you need help. Uh, you want to delegate that to external technology. Um, so uh, here's a quote from someone I just wanted to read because I think it really captures that. This is a sort of frustrated utterance of someone who is both a technology designer and a longtime self-tracker. And she said, we're on the brink of these devices that will monitor things and give you actionable updates before you even need to ask. I don't want to track. I want it to be done for me. Please insert a chip in my mouth and have it record the calories for me. So I think that the customers that device makers are imagining resemble, they, they share that sentiment. They, they want to outsource this labor to personal sensor technologies. Uh, so by offering consumers a way to kind of fill the cultural, fulfill the cultural demand for self-management, but al also delegate it, um, there's, there's both an exemplification and a short-circuiting of uh, ideals of agency, I think. So here you see, I couldn't resist uh, getting this in there. There's a device called the, uh, the Sense Mother uh, that almost too nicely captures this, this externalization of responsibility to technology. She, this is a mother who gives you whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, if at first it was about know thyself, now over on the uh, left, their mother knows everything um, using sensors that are called um, motion cookies. You see those cookies here. Uh, you can uh, put them around in your environment. So there's an interesting sort of merging of Internet of Things with self-tracking here um, because you're, you're not always wearing them, but the things that are important to you wear them and then um, track from there and intercede to quench your thirst. You know, I fix a sensor to the bottle. It encourages me to drink when I forget. So it's almost like you're existing in this <coughs> world, this hostile world that isn't a holding world. It doesn't have checks and tell you or direct you or push you in the right direction. It's not a very mothering and holding environment. So you carry your mother around with you, little mother, and you kind of She's in your back pocket with your keys. She's on the water bottle. Um, and you know, certainly the, the marketing here is playful, but if you actually watch the ads, uh, they're not simply humorous and funny and absurd. They're depicting very real scenarios that I assure you, you will relate to, especially if you have elderly parents, because this isn't just about self-tracking, it's about um, tracking um, others, whether it's your child, your mom, does she remember to take her pill, this kind of thing. So, um, the, the website of Mother says, simply live your life. You know, these will allow you to just live. And so there, living doesn't mean reflecting. Uh, living means going about what you need to go about, and you're relieved, you're lightened, you're, you're, your weight is lifted. Um, the sensors will, quote, blend into your life and adapt to your behavior without requiring any effort, training, or care from you. Um, <laughs> So there's a kind of algorithmic care, I guess. Um, this is just depicting um, the information that you have. So then you, you call your dad you know, and say, um, I think you missed your pill. <coughs> so uh, this thermostatic the logic I've been alluding to is literalized here. Another one that I couldn't resist getting in. It's just um, come out now onto the market. Um, and what's interesting here if you watch what's going on, maybe I'll turn the sound up for you. Hot or cold? What is your preference? How do you stay comfortable when you're not in control of the temperature? So you're not in control um, of your environment. So is she. Finally, the solution is here. Ember Wave. First wearable that lets you cool down or warm up when you need it most. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, some of you may have picked up on this. This is not tracking you. 
we've moved, th this is keeping you on track and it's in the aisle of the tracking technology, uh, but it is not self-tracking really. Uh, it's not gathering data on you. It's something that um, you in a moment of heat or cool can resort to to correct the situation. It's a court, uh, course correcting situation. So you're an agent here in the sense that you're, you're, you're saying, you know, help um, and, and pressing this button. Um, and <coughs> one that's very like that, I think, is the think, some of you may have heard um, of this. I know academics are always interested in this. Um, I was in the beta testing for this as part of my research. This is another device that doesn't track you. Um, and in fact, so it sits alongside a set of other uh, both the Fitbit and then other things that do collect information and show it to you, like the, the Muse brain sensing headband that's supposed to train you to meditate better in a sort of module way. You don't wear it all day, you, you kind of learn, and it's, it's essentially neurofeedback. Um, but neurofeedback and consulting your Fitbit dashboard and deciding what changes to make in your life is articulated in, by, by the, um, the founder of this company as extra labor. That why should we have to do that when we have technology that does it for us? So you choose um, energize or calm. You put it on your head and apparently FDA trials have shown 90% of us will respond. It's either like half, half a Valium or two cups of coffee. Um, and what was odd to me in the beta testing was that I, I said, you know, okay, now you're fixing it to my head. Are you taking me to like a chamber with uh, low lights? To do I need to close my eyes and sit? And they're like, there's tons of people walking around, fluorescent lights. They're like, no, do whatever you want. You could go down to the cafe. You could check your email um, because it wasn't tracking me. It was just, you know, one, one direction in, um, and it, it didn't depend on me in any way. It was just doing doing its work there. So. Um, <coughs> And then, you know, I promise one of the very last things, this is less of an app a, a, than a vision. So this is Ariana Huffington um, and her hope that one day someone would create an app that could gauge the state of your mind, body, and spirit and then automatically offer the exact steps you would need to realign all three aspects of your being. And she refers here to being that we are off course uh, more than we are on course and that um, the app would work by uh, providing you with measures of your stress levels, your heart rate, weight variability, and then connecting them to, connecting you to whatever you need to get to, to a place of balance. So it wouldn't just be something for temperature, just, it would be all integrated. So it might pull, um, you know, a relaxing playlist that had been shown historically to have a certain effect on your heart rate or photo of a person or place you love. And, there's plenty of people out there I've talked to who are trying um, to do things like this. So she says, what we need is a great course correcting mechanism, a GPS for the soul. So this thermostat logic is at work, um, not only on the body um, and these sort of stepping, sitting, breathing, chewing, but also on the, on the soul. So um, I'm at my last slide and I've, I've sort of embedded my conclusion throughout my, con my analysis throughout my comments already. But I think when you follow this line of wearable technology and sort of try to track uh, through the, the changing rhetoric and the changing design of, and algorithms of the, the technology out there, um, you see that the, the, the sort of self-optimizing, transhuman, unconstrained vision uh, that, that comes from certain voices in journalists who love to, to paint those pictures of this stuff, even within QS, some scholars, I think it too quickly grants that this is all about the self-mastering, maximizing subject. Um, and as I've said, certainly that subject, the enterprise subject that we're demand that, that's demanded of us, that form of subjectivity, is a really important starting point and part of the story. But then if you look at what's happening and how it's playing out, um, I think we're allocating, you know, we're being equipped with technologies that can help us be that subject, but the way we're, that depends on being non-sovereign. So there's an assumption of a sort of non-sovereign um, subject here, uh, a subject who needs a mother 
and I didn't I didn't throw it in here, but I, I have somebody sent me saw saw a version of this talk and sent me a, um, a tweet that they had remembered of a designer in Silicon Valley who said it seems like everything every product we're designing these days is about um, how to get uh, get something you know that our mother used to give us so some reference to um, or these little mothers that we're trying to um, festoon ourselves with so. Um, I think I'll end there and open to questions. Thank you. Paul? Um, so thank you. I really enjoyed this. And I love this, this notion of this sort of delegation to, to, to an, an, a technical other, to like, you know, take away responsibility. And, and it was reminding me of um, some work some undergrads did with me a few years ago, which was a, a, which, where a very similar phenomenon came out, and it was around computer security. It was around the complexity of managing your information securely and sort of starting to think about the various ways in which that responsibility might be delegated, sometimes to technical others, sometimes to institutional others, and so forth. And it struck me that what they both have in common is, uh, is a deep anxiety over things that are too complex to know. And I'm kind of intrigued by that sort of anxiety part of this, like how, you, how we sort of manifest this whole thing about you know, it's actually too hard to keep track of how often you walk around. I'm not sure in what world it's too right. hard to keep track of this, but, it's, but, there's, but there's this production of anxiety is sort of necessary right. as a first part. But there's part. a new need to be aware of the steps right. because they're what matter to our sort of outcome of our life. Right. So I'm just like, I, but I'm always, I always sort of want to push back towards the 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 anxieties. And I actually really like the way you're framing this. Actually, in terms of an anxiety of choice, an anxiety of like you know options. It's like I've I've made these decisions and these and these commitments. But I wonder like how much you've been looking at where the where the anxieties come from and how they are figured into these <laughs> narratives. So um, I, said, I said at the beginning that uh, this was going to focus on the design side. So were I to all give right. a talk instead on um, the, the experience, I really didn't talk at all about the experience of wearing this. It's more the vision of who are these consumers and what do they want. And it's not that the consumers contradict that. But when they start to talk and articulate where that anxiety comes from, and what, what is it that they're doing you know, when they wear this? Um, you get a lot more of this palpable kind of anxiety. Um, and what, one of the things that got me on the path towards this project also uh, was, um, I knew, as I said, I was interested in doing something on tracking, and so that was a time uh, when online poker had just exploded, and people were saying, my husband actually played it, and he said, you know, there's a lot of tracking going on. It's become almost a requisite part of it that you need to use these intensive data tracking. <coughs> and so I did a side article um, and project with on high stakes online poker players and how they, uh, why they did it, how, how they, a sort of phenomenolo phenomenological analysis of their use of the HUD, which is a real, tri real time tracking dashboard that is both um, modeling, uh, giving them, you could say, the virtual tells for their opponents but also tracking the tells that they are giving off to their opponents. And then they bring in things like timers and metronomes and try to like scramble the data. So it was a very, <laughs> uh, very intensive activity. And at the, if, you, if you sort of got below all the complexity of it and asked like, what, what is at stake here? It was, and I call this article abiding chance because it's this, it's this sort of, you could say really human uh, difficulty processing the infinite statistical plane and squaring it with what you feel like when you're at a live poker game it is an event in time that depends on other people and it feels really big but it can put you into tilt a state of human passion and so what they were doing with all this tracking technology was trying to remain untilted mm -hmm. and trying to act in a kind of leap of faith act from a statistical plane that they could never really get. And so there's, there's even some, some kind of like religious thing you could, you could say there that that's infinitude and probability took the place of God. And you could never really be God or reach God. It was this leap of faith where you had to breathe through it like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to tilt here. I'm not going to look at my winnings or my losses for the day. I'm just going to try to like live a godly life 
which is to breathe through it. And so, so that seemed to be what was at stake here. Um, Great, thanks. I don't know who to call on right behind Paul. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, that was wonderful. I'm really curious from the design perspective, if you thought about the affective design of um, the wearable objects themselves, or the, the objects themselves, and thinking about the mother um, and the way that, at least from the images you showed, um, there was a sense that when something didn't happen, right, like the pill wasn't taken, you have the angry <coughs> mother. You um, have the what? An angry mother. Okay. Um, but it's also a very like simple, relatable, cute object. Um, and just my own history with wearables is that I had a kind of off-brand Fitbit at some point that I thought, never will I use this. I don't want to be part of the quantified self movement. But um, when I would hit my, my walking goal for the day, it would like flash a little um, fireworks. And I found <laughs> myself really wanting to make it happy mm -hmm. um, more than I cared about my own <laughs> steps. So I'm, I'm just curious whether the, you know, the kind of emotional design of these objects as objects has come into the research that you've done. Yeah, so just to, uh, about the, the particular design of the, of the mothers, there's another paper that I do that's called, that was um, directly addressing, um, I mentioned there's a lot of scholar literature on, on privacy issues, and as this is all unfolding, people are all, and they're, they're buying these, they're also outraged by the NSA and this kind of thing, so how do those go together? So I gave this talk called uh, From Big Brother to Little Mother, trying to kind of, <laughs> parse the, the differences happening there. And Big Brother is usually <laughs> depicted as this um, steely, uh, you know, often an eye that is looking at you, that has, it, has you in its sights. Um, and there's all sorts of ways in which Mother doesn't act that way. She's always smiling. She doesn't get angry. She's nurturing. Um, she she does she's not an angry mom. Mm. No, she's a, she's a those glowing mom. eyes that maybe creepy. Maybe the glowing eyes. <laughs> yeah. Um, here maybe we'll play the ad just to. I think there's a scene of mother in action. And it's happy music. <laughs> She's got mother under her pillow through the, the cookie. There she is. <laughs> so it's kind of cute, like the eyes blink, right? So, yeah, not so creepy. Um, and absolutely, I think you want to please mother, right? You, you don't want her sitting there smiling. You're going to feel really guilty if she's like smiling and sitting on the shelf and you're not actually um, doing these things that you know will help you. Um, there's, there's other uh, forms of design, and I've heard a lot from people that there's like the, does anyone use, what is it called? There's a plant, um, there's, a, there's a hydration app, Plant Nanny. And so you are, I guess, the nanny. You are in the position of caring for the plant, and it's kind of a cute plant, and you decide what kind of plant, and then it grows. <laughs> and if you're not having your water and, and logging it, it, it withers and dies, and it's actually, you get really sad. You're like, I have to um, get my plant to be happy again. Um, then there's, there's, I mean, just, I said moving target a few times. But it's not just a moving target in time. The shift isn't happening just there. The, the, diversity. It's also happening <coughs> in any one moment. If you go and you look at a Best Buy, what's on the shelf, you know, the Digital Health Summit, what's being showcased. And it can be really competing logics of design and logics of behavioral change. There can be, and it's really frustrating for me because I almost want, I'm like, no, you cannot throw in like three teaspoons of Skinner box and then add a dash of positive psychology. Like there's a, there's a rich tension there, like those things are incompatible. But it's almost like just throwing at the wall all of these, these logics of change, whether it's from behavioral economics or from affective design or um, you know, various things that might motivate people or, or engage them and kind of mixing them up and seeing what works. And another development is this interesting side um, it's, it's almost a new <coughs> career you can have is to come up with, it's usually four types of people on a grid, and there's, uh, you know, 90% of us are not people motivated by seeing our own data. That's the QS geek, right? So that's the geek. 
Then there are the social butterflies. The social butterflies are motivated by like a Strava type thing where you um, are competing against others. And within that, it could be positive, like reward for doing best, or it could be turning into a potato on a couch when you don't go run. So that's more punitive. So there's just all of the, and then there's, you know, you want to stop smoking cigarettes. It could be a gamified reward system. It could be punitive. It could be a monetary-based thing, or it could be a weaning model, where there's like a mom who says, um, you know, go have another cigarette. I'll tell you when you can have your next one. And so the vision is that these people would be in every doctor's office, and they would give you almost a Meyer Briggs test for what you would be motivated by, um, and then a cocktail of the correct apps and devices. Yeah. Yeah. Is there like a distinction in the field between like intrinsically designed um, experiences and extrinsically ones? So, for example, um, a Fitbit is extrinsic. You need to walk. That's not usually something you're doing as part of any part of your day as far as like monitoring it. But if you're playing Pokemon Go and that's how you're meeting your, your walking goal, so if you're not using a Fitbit, that's intrinsic to the game experience. So mm -hmm. it's not telling you how much you're walking. Uh, well, I mean, there's badges for it, but it's not necessarily the motivating factor between why you play Pokemon Go. So it's in walking is intrinsic to that experience, whereas like uh, the Fitbit itself is like extrinsic. So you're mm. you have that one device specifically for walking, and it's only for. But that. I know plenty of people who will do the Wii Fit or the Pokemon Go. Mm. Time to get my exercise. I'm going to play this, yeah. and also maybe even more people who don't say I'm going to exercise now. Let me put my Fitbit on, <coughs> but just look at it at the end of the day as I've gone on the subway and to teach my classes how many steps. So I'm not sure it's so. Um, so easy to assign to one kind of device. This is a sort of more intrinsic motivator than another. Um, so, like, the but person, it's good to think about the person's things. intentions can have a lot of impact in how the design gets utilized as a tool. Yeah, I mean, I, Strava is one that is very much like you're going to go on your bike ride now. It's not like it tells you how often you randomly biked without thinking about it. You know? um, so really, I guess it really depends. Yeah. Uh, so the transition from devices like Fitbit to devices like Sense Mother uh, stresses on the fact that all you need is an instantaneous push rather than just looking at the figures at the end of the day. For instance, looking at the 10,000 steps figure at the end of the day does not motivate <coughs> me much or just gives me some extra information, but if there is some device on my hand which just gives me a notch like every one hour or every two hours or whatever its mechanism is, that's going to be much more effective in me traveling more steps in a day. That's the, the idea. Yeah. And there is a history to that kind of device. So what, do you remember those, it would always be like on those shopping channels, there would be the, um, like either it would go around your stomach or the thighs. I mean, they still have these. Um, ads that you can see where people are they're like relaxing and reading a magazine but uh, what is that called it's like the TM something <coughs> where you're it's exercising your legs for you and it's like this desire that I don't have to make this effort that, I, that this thing is going to do it for me and so the logic here is more that how can we uh, motivate people to not have to have this grueling moment of overcoming their resistance. Like how can we just integrate it in their day? Um, and there are some that do s go over more to the punitive side that will literally shock you. Um, there's the, it's a play on words, it's called the Pavlock. And you can, um, in the latest generations of it, um, and I have one, it, it, some people react like they jump out of their skin and then other, you can calibrate it. Other people don't really feel it. I'm kind of in between. and. Um, you can program your phone to shock you if you are sitting still too long. So it isn't just <laughs> nudge, poke, maybe you want to stand up. It's and then you, know, you, you stand up um, or not, I guess, for, for some people. But um. So although these devices are using data, but they do not uh, intend to, they do not have to show the data to you because it's not going to matter, right? It just does it analysis and does the actual things for you which are going to help you. It usually has an option where you can see the data, but I think the idea is that that's not enough. So, so if, if I were to say like 2013, 14, 15, 2013 was you're the QS, know thyself, information provision, compass. 
Uh, the next year um, was more about, uh-oh, this isn't really working, meaningful insights, actionable insights. How can, so there was a lot of stress on visualization that year. How can we not just give numbers, but give numbers in a way that will motivate people to change? But that wasn't quite enough. So that was almost like coach who will tell you more and explain to you what you need to do so you don't have to decide. But then there's, you know, that why have any of that at all when it can just sort of do it for you? And I guess the think is extreme, right? Because you're not participating. I mean, to use AI <coughs> term, like there's no human in the loop really there. I mean, it's in the loop as an object, but <coughs> not, as a, not as a subject, not as a per participating subject. Uh, and there's other technologies sort of trying to just push and prod you. Yeah. Uh, you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, considering the, the note of kind of the last act of your presentation, do you have any uh, optimistic insight about how we might escape the little but still dystopian tyrannical algorithmic overlord mother? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd unpack that. Like, I love that sentence you just uttered, but I would unpack <laughs> it like at every word I'd say, are we sure tyrannical? Like, right. we had that question, and I don't think she's tyrannical. I, I, I asked um, somewhat kind of cheeky, but, but, al but also kind of like to, to escape, like if there's something that doesn't sit well with you, I think it, it's a disservice to too quickly call it tyrannical big brother because the tools for resisting big brother are not the tools, are not the right tools for resisting this. So first pause mm -hmm. and try to understand the specificity of what's going on. Um, you know, if this is a form of power that's exerting itself, how is it how is it working and there's plenty of theorists that could be harnessed um, you know we could call this biopower we could call it you know top down or we could think about other you know more dispersed and, and I do think that there's something to the focus on tiny little bits and moments which is really different and you're you're not being targeted like a panopticon or surveilled your whole being and what your act is it's you're, and no one's looking. She has eyes, but actually she's not seeing. She's picking up many, many, many little bits and then assembling a pattern. So the self at stake here is a time series self, um, and that's a different political subject. So I don't have the answer there. Like, I don't have the answer of how to escape, but I just think, first of all, we have to really understand the specificity. Uh, so I think um, maybe we take we can all, there's always more time for questions downstairs. Yeah, what, so what we'd like to do is actually move move the discussion downstairs. Okay, so yeah, I'll take more questions downstairs. And we'll have the, um, <coughs> we'll have snacks and all those sorts of good things. Okay. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>